I was casting around recently for evidence relating to my next YouTube video, which is to say this one, when I came across a book described as an examination of science, scepticism, and the inexplicable powers of the human mind. Its title was Extraordinary Knowing, and it focused on knowledge gained by people without reliance on their standard five senses of perception. One chapter featured anecdotes and analysis of several intuitives in the United States who could inexplicably obtain accurate knowledge of other people and their affairs as if out of thin air. Another chapter discussed remote viewing as described by leaders in this field who had worked for the CIA and the Stargate program. And a third chapter considered the importance of Gestalt theory as a way of understanding why some scientists simply cannot accept a worldview that includes a reality greater than materialism. It looked at the figure and ground as illustrated by this image. If you concentrate on the white portion, there are two faces opposite each other. If you look at the black portion, you see the shape of a vase. But you can't see both the vase and the faces at the same time. Maybe sceptics can only see in one colour, and it excludes seeing the wide picture. The author was a psychoanalyst and clinical professor at the University of California in Berkeley, Dr Elizabeth Lloyd Mayer, seen here. She died shortly after completing this book in 2005, aged only 57. Known to her friends as Lisby, Professor Mayer, received the Distinguished Analysts Award from the American Psychoanalytic Association and was a fellow of the International Consciousness Research Laboratories at Princeton. What stirred my interest in the book and inspired Professor Mayer's motive for researching it provided the first chapter and it was entitled The Harp That Came Back. For Lisby, this was a shattering personal experience causing a major re-evaluation of everything she thought she knew about the nature of reality. Briefly, her daughter had an expensive custom-made harp stolen after a Christmas concert in Oakland in December 1991. It might have been like this one. The police were no help in recovering it, nor was a CBS news story, nor could the American Harp Society help. So it seemed to be lost forever. That is, until a friend challenged Lisby to ask a dowser for assistance in locating it, an idea that she thought was preposterous. But at this point she had nothing to lose, so she did seek a dowser's help. Bear in mind that Lisby and her daughter lived in California, and they consulted the president of the American Society of Dowsers, who lived 2,000 miles away in Arkansas. It took only moments for this man, Harold, to confirm on the telephone that the harp was still in their hometown, and he requested a local map of Oakland to be sent to him. On receipt of this, he quickly located the harp in a particular house in a particular street, without ever coming to Oakland himself. Based on this information, however, the police still refused to take out a search warrant. So Lisby put advertisements in the street all around the suspected house, offering a reward for the finder. By a circuitous method to protect the identity, the thief was paid and the harp was returned to her daughter. For Professor Mayer, this was a life-changing event. How could such extraordinary knowledge be obtained at great distance? And what does it say about the nature of reality? This is what inspired her subsequent research and her book, and it also inspired me to find out more about dowsing. So I turned to Dowsing Today, the magazine of the British Dowsing Society. And I discovered that in addition to the American Dowsing Society, there are dowsing groups in locations all over the UK with an annual conference attended by dowsers from mainland Europe, from India, South Korea and Japan. And if you care to search YouTube, you'll find over 400 videos on dowsing, of which, as you might expect, some ridicule the practice. The most recognised form of dowsing is water divining. 
some folk think this was the original purpose, with its existence going back thousands of years. In the obituary column of my magazine was a brother, James Kimpton, who died in October 2017 at the age of 92. It appears he was a saintly man devoted to helping the poor and destitute in South India. He lived for 53 years in an area that was regularly affected by drought. Over the years, and using his dowsing skills, he located 2,400 wells. He ran one charity called Water for Life and another called Reaching the Unreached, helping thousands of marginalised people by building schools for orphans and 8,700 houses for the poor. Speaking to the national newspaper The Hindu during a drought in Tamil Nadu, he said, So far this year I've divined 55 water sources, all gave good water. The average depth was 300 feet through granite. There are many families in remote areas now leaving their villages to find a meagre supply of water. He said it cost about £1,000, that's around US dollars to pay for a complete water supply, including the cost of hiring the drilling rig and installing a water tank with taps. And he said the four-year-long drought in his area made it imperative to find water for villagers with no water at all. Our method is quite unorthodox for scientists, he admitted, but our rate of success is better than 90%. I always require a site plan of the village, no matter how far away it is, and using a small wooden pendulum on a cord, I trace the streams crisscrossing the village site plan. This takes about five minutes. The pendulum will tell us where the streams are, how many there are, at what depths they are, and in what direction they flow. Also, whether the water is sweet or brackish. And even, if we really want to know, how many thousand litres per hour are coming through that spot. The site plan will end up with a series of red lines drawn by my left hand while I watch the pendulum and not the felt pen. It's much like an ECG machine tracing the lines on a graph. I can mark streams on site plans from even several hundred miles away. Once we're in the village, we find the spot more accurately using a metal pendulum. Reactions can vary very strongly, with the pendulum flying around at great speed until fingers hurt. When we hit really strong water, the pendulum will rotate like a helicopter blade, and there's no way that kind of reaction can be faked. So, from this report, it may appear that dowsing is genuine, but there are plenty of sceptics keen to rubbish the practice. This includes the usual list of professional sceptics, the American-Canadian stage magician James Randi, the Oxford evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins, and Professor Chris French, formerly the editor of the Skeptic magazine. All these are to be found on YouTube. Other YouTube movies frankly describe dowsing as bullshit. They argue that in their tests, dowsers perform at a level no better than chance. Certainly, James Randi does in his Encyclopedia of Claims, Frauds and Hoaxes of the Occult and Supernatural. But one could argue with their experimental design that includes dowsers of unproven ability being invited to locate a single plastic bottle of water hidden in one of numerous above-ground boxes, instead of catering to what competent dowsers really do, which is detecting water flowing underground. Dawkins calls the dowsers deluded. French says that dowsing is no better than guesswork. But let's face it, they would, wouldn't they? It's what sceptics do. And if the practice is bunk, well, why were the British companies Seven Trent Water, Yorkshire Water and Anglian Water among 10 out of 12 water companies reported in the Guardian newspaper in 2017 acknowledging that they sometimes use dowsers for finding leaks and locating underground pipes? The Guardian newspaper alleged that company executives and engineers seem no more immune to pseudoscience than the rest of the population. 
the website Life Science is equally sceptical in its article entitled The Pseudoscience of Water Witching. But I acknowledge the validity of its criticism of tradition alone, that it must work because people have been doing it for centuries. They argue that simply because a practice has endured for hundreds of years, that does not prove it must be effective and they counter with the example of physicians for almost 2,000 years practicing bloodletting, believing it would restore health to sick patients. So now water divining has been damned. Or has it? The truth is, dowsers are not put off by sceptics, and dowsing has a growing number of adherents. They say it's a respectable branch of biophysics with a strong link to the study of consciousness and the issue of non-locality and quantum physics. And a study financed by the German government was published in the 1980s in the Journal of Scientific Exploration, a Stanford University peer-reviewed scientific journal. The aim was to find cheaper, more reliable ways of locating drinking water in parched third world countries. Researchers analysed the successes and failures of dowsers over a 10-year period at more than 2,000 sites in the arid regions of Sri Lanka, Zaire, Kenya, Namibia and Yemen. Guided by dowsers, drill crews did not hit water every time, but their success rate was impressive. In Sri Lanka, for example, they drilled 691 holes with a 96% success rate. Hans-Dieter Betz, a University of Munich physicist and the research group leader, said in hundreds of cases the dowsers were able to predict the depth of the water source and the yield of the well to within 10 or 20 percent. They far exceeded lucky guesses. What's more, virtually all the sites in Sri Lanka were in regions where the odds of finding water by random drilling were extremely low and the underground sources were so narrow that misplacing the drill by only a few feet would mean digging a dry hole. Anticipating criticism of their findings, the German researchers matched their fieldwork with laboratory experiments in which they had dowsers attempt to locate water-filled pipes inside a building similar to those tests usually used by sceptics, and their results were also similarly discouraging. While sceptics see this as evidence of failure, Betts saw the discrepancy as an important clue. There are two things I am certain of after ten years of field research, he says. A combination of dowsing and modern techniques can be more successful and less expensive than we had thought. Well, if anyone can do it, I decided to join a local dowsing group and give it a go, and I made these rods. Day one was a bit of a surprise. During training, we were shown how to consciously turn our dowsing rods and revolve our pendulums to register instructions to it, like yes and no. It seemed like programming the rods, but was more likely to involve programming ourselves. But less of me, I know nothing of this subject. This is Tim Walter, a professional trainer in this art. First thing, as a novice dowser, first thing you'll find is when you start, now I'm going to do these manually, okay? When you start to douse, you may find that just one, the edge of it one, a little bit like that, just moves slowly and gently and gradually, hardly any response at all. That's absolutely fine. Don't focus on the rods themselves when you ask a question. Ask the question, focus on the question, and ask yourself something that you know to start with just to get the rods to move for yourself, okay? And as you practice, 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 practice by using the most tangible things you can find. Don't go plunging straight away into earth energy. Practice for a day or so. Get your rods working really well for you so that instead of just that little tiny movement that you might get on one, you get a good swing. So a good swing would be something like, so yes, that sort of response, okay? And don't forget that if it's a no, so if I say, am I sitting down, they'll come apart for a no. Okay. By the way, Tim Walter has published a huge array of education videos on dowsing, so you might want to look him up on YouTube. Here's another clip of him explaining remote dowsing using a pendulum. So, um, holding the pendulum so that it swings freely in a forwards and backwards motion, basically straight ahead, okay? 
So you see it, so I'm giving it a bit of a, a jiggle so that it swings. And I'm just holding it uh, wherever I feel is comfortable so that it swings. I could hold it on a long thing like this, but that means I've got to put quite a lot of energy into actually getting it swing. Uh, you can hold it as short as you like, like that. Well, that's okay. But it's about there that I find fairly comfortable. Okay, so get it swinging. And then you want to ask it for a positive response. Ask the pendulum to show you a positive response. And my positive response is that it actually swings clockwise. Okay, so thank you. And then we ask it for a negative response. Show me a detrimental negative response, please. And that is that it swings anti-clockwise. There we go. So a little bit going that way. Uh, that's to set up your yes and your no. Some people's will vary. It won't always be like that. Mine is that, and it's consistently that. Um, some might find that when you get a no, the pendulum just continues to just sit going backwards and forwards. Some people may find the opposite way round to what I had there. So they may find that a yes is going round anti-clockwise and a no is clockwise. But mine, yes, clockwise, no, anti-clockwise. Don't worry about how dowsing works, but this is the way that it... Um, you know, this is the technique, okay? So you get it going, and then you would ask a question like we did with the rods, like, am I standing up? And the answer is a no. So here you see it swinging anti-clockwise. Am I sitting down? Well, the answer is yes. Obviously, we know the answer to these things because I'm doing it, but this is purely for demonstration purposes. Now, in order to become a competent dowser, and it needs a lot of practice, you need a good instruction book. So I bought this one, entitled Dowsing, by Elizabeth Brown, which I can thoroughly recommend. Her website says that dowsing physically demonstrates the existence of an invisible world of energy outside the one we perceive with our five senses. Elizabeth Brown is a very talented conference presenter. When you're dowsing, you have to choose your dowsing tool. Some people use what we call L rods or dowsing rods or sticks. Some people use a forked stick that they hold. Some people use a pendulum. So it's first of all you choose the dowsing tool that, you, that, you're, that you're comfortable with. And then you need to decide what sort of dowsing you're going to do, whether you're going to use your dowsing to find something physical or something specific, or whether you're going to use your dowsing tool to tap into the information field to get information, answers to your questions. The book covers a very broad range of subjects under the heading of dowsing. People will find out what dowsing is, who can do it, how to do it, right from beginner level through to more advanced dowsing. Um, they will find out how they can find their own particular niche and how they can fine-tune their abilities. They will find out um, the scientific discoverers, the cutting-edge scientific discoverers, that actually explain the mechanics of dowsing and how it works and where the information comes from, which is actually quite critical. In addition to providing practical tips, what the author also endeavours to do is to explain how dowsing works. If you ask most dowsers, they'll probably tell you they don't know how it works, only that it does. And some might mention the subconscious or they may point to metaphysical explanations, often involving the superior knowledge of the higher self, whatever that is. And more often than not, there's reference to what are called idiomotor muscle movements, which dowsers say are involuntary once the techniques have been learned, while sceptics assure us that this proves that it's all fraud. Dowsing rod movements are seen as amplifiers of what the individual discovers, not that the dowsing rods or pendulums are independent recipients of information. Elizabeth Brown sees dowsing as related to what's called the zero-point energy field, which I shall try to describe in this way. Zero-point energy is thought to be an ever-present field of energy created by the eternal vibration of everything that is. And there are plenty of books about its importance. According to quantum field theory, the universe is not a collection of individual things or isolated particles, but a continuous fluctuating field. Atoms, molecules and empty space all fluctuate continuously and minutely with subatomic particles forever vibrating in and out of existence, creating endless energy in the process. 
currently a full theory for the zero-point energy field has still to be finalised, although the renowned physicist Richard Feynman, one of the best known and best regarded physicists in the world, not least for his work on the atom bomb in World War II, together with John Wheeler, the American theoretical physicist who coined the term wormhole and was largely responsible for reviving interest in general relativity in the United States in the post-war period. Well, together, they calculated that the zero-point energy in a single light bulb contains enough energy to boil all the world's oceans. But there's an extra issue here. The zero-point field is also credited with being a repository for all the information that ever was regarding the universe, the Earth, and all of life. In theosophy, this information is called the Akashic Record, with alternative names being used in early Buddhism and in Islam. The Akashic Records are seen as a compendium of all human events, thoughts, words, emotions and intent ever to have occurred in the past, present or future, and encoded in a non-physical plane of existence known as the etheric plane. Or in modern terms, the zero-point field, which is regarded as non-local, which is to say having its existence outside of time and space. It's this information plane that Elizabeth Brown thinks dowsers get their information from. Now, I'm not sure I've done a brilliant job explaining this, so in case you want to know more, let me refer you to a book by Lynn McTaggart, who, according to her author profile, is a spokesperson on consciousness, the new physics, and the practices of conventional and alternative medicine. Her book entitled The Field does a much better job of clarifying what it is than I've managed. But the truth is, there are many professional dowsers who will undertake investigations on your behalf, and if people are willing to part with their money for these services, as seems to be the case, then surely dowsers must have some value. For example, the British Dowsing Society website shows 33 professional dowsers registered and available for consultations. In addition to the business of locating water, underground pipes and lost items, dowsing is used for other weird purposes too, including locating and following ley lines across the countryside. Essentially, these lines form a sort of grid said to be composed of the Earth's natural energies. Although not being detectable by magnetometers or other scientific equipment, some folk scorn this type of dowsing. Related to this is what's called geopathic stress dowsing for unhealthy buildings. The nearest parallel I can draw is to think of the Chinese art of feng shui. I hope I pronounced that correctly. It's also used successfully for archaeological investigations, such as finding the underground shape of former buildings. And some people use it for contacting the spirit world. And finally, but not least, it has uses in diagnosing the origins and causes of a person's persistent poor health, which is the specialism of Elizabeth Brown. Now, I don't have the depth of experience to comment on the efficacy of all these different types of dowsing, and I prefer to stick with backing the proven practice of finding water and lost items. Interestingly, dowsing has been compared with remote viewing, the efficacy of which is not in doubt. But the very fact that Elizabeth Brown has clients in 30 countries and that dowsing is currently carried out all around the world suggests that she and Tim Walter, both featured in this program, plus their dowsing peers, are surely more than just onto something. Thanks for listening. We're in this age where science and spirituality are merging. And you know, over the years, I've met quite a few science-based logical thinkers that are actually very keen dowsers. And they are the ones that have said to me, it doesn't matter how it works. If it works, just use it. And I can guarantee you that if you try dowsing, you're going to find it's really, really helpful in your life.